I started last October teaching fourth grade. Fourth grade, and how has that been so far? Um, well, considering that I started teaching when I was seven months pregnant, it, it was pretty challenging, and I started already when the year began. I started in October. So the first year, they always tell you, like, in teaching, the first year, you don't really, like, how do I say it? They say they tell you just survive the first year. Like, try to survive, mm. get into your rhythms, find your routines. So needless to say, you know, coming in seven months pregnant, then leaving to have a baby, mm -hmm. and then come back <laughs> being in postpartum, it was it was an eventful first Ooh. year, that's for sure. <laughs> there you go, okay. Yeah. And um, so you teach fourth grade, where at? I teach fourth grade at Community Christian Academy in Lowell. In Lowell, oh my gosh. Mm -hmm. And so are you planning to do fourth grade around this year again? I am, yeah, I signed on for another year. So tell us a little bit about your educational background, maybe uh, some of the titles that you hold and so forth. Okay, yeah, so uh, I went to North Point Bible College there. I got a bachelor's in um, Bible and theology. We actually double major there. It's a uh, major in Bible and theology, and then also a major focusing in student ministry, so working with youth and, um, and with kids. Mm. And what was your, what is like one of the dearest memories that you hold from North Point? Oh gosh, there's so many, there's Aww. so many, so many <laughs> really, really good memories. Cause I still have my friends that I graduated with, like I still, I still see them. I'm still in contact with them even many years later. But I think that the most, I guess the best memory that I have is meeting my husband. Oh, wow. Yes. So how do you guys meet? We, uh... <laughs> Sorry, guys, she is taken. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> for those of you wondering. Yes, I am taken. I've been married for three years now. He did put a ring on it. Yes, he did. <laughs> <laughs> I met my husband. Um, we were friends first. We met January 2018. You know what? I've never met a couple that were husband and wife first. Oh, so yeah. That, I, I would yeah. hope so. <laughs> okay. Well, yeah, usually people, like, they start, like, oh, I met this person and I wanted to date them. That wasn't me and my husband. In Vegas. Yeah, right? No. No, 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 no. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we met. We had, like, mutual friend groups. The first time we met, I actually don't remember. We were exchanging books for classes or something. Mm. Um, but I was, like, I was a nervous wreck my first semester. Um, I was six hours away from where I lived. I was on my own, so I was really nervous. But we ended up being really, really good friends, connecting over um faith, of course, and talking about the Bible and theology. And it wasn't until I think like the summertime mm. that he was the one who had interest. He had interest and he told me he had interest over a like a Skype call or something. And I told him, okay, I'm going <laughs> to pray on this and I'm going to wait. And I made him wait the whole summer. <laughs> wow. Okay. I made him wait the whole summer to tell him if I liked him back or not. Number one, because I wanted to see if he was actually going to be patient and wait. And, mm. and also to seek God's face as well, because I just got to college. So mm -hmm. he did wait. And in August, I came back and I was like, yeah, I like you too. And a couple of months later, we started dating and the rest is history. Oh my goodness. That's so beautiful. <laughs> Pastor yeah. Gilbert, bro. Yes, <laughs> Somebody out. deserves a dinner out because, uh, <laughs> good. wow, that's really, really cool. And while you were in college, did you always know that you were going to be a private school teacher or did you have other plans before you graduated? I had no idea I was going to be a teacher. I wanted... My goal when I was at school, I always wanted to be a youth pastor. I wanted to serve in ministry. That was my main goal. But while I was at North Point in my second year, I also got called to missions. Um, mm. And I'm, I'm still called to be a missionary now. It's just me being in my youth pastor, my youth pastor position is preparation for when I do um, fulfill that missions calling. So I never... I had no idea that I was going to be a school teacher. Um, but when I was interviewing for it, there really didn't seem like there was much of a difference between being a youth pastor and a teacher. The only difference was curriculum. That was really mm. the only difference. That's really, really interesting. And I think there's a lot, um, a lot of questions that we're actually going to ask about curriculum because a lot of people have a lot of misconceptions about private school, especially when it's a faith-based private school, yes. as you know, um, and as you've probably experienced in, in, in this last year that you've been through this. Mm -hmm. Um, so I know that your husband is also a teacher. Is that correct? Yeah, he is a, um, a teacher mentor, um, in the Lowell and Lawrence districts. Mm. And what are some of the most difficult challenges that you faced as a private teacher? Oh boy. Um, I, <laughs> there are, there are some challenges I will say, um, there are a lot of benefits to it as well, though. Working with kids is, is, I love working with kids. Some people find it exhausting, of course, but I think the most challenging thing working in a private Christian school setting sometimes could be funding, um, hmm. sometimes could be uh, resources, um, because private school institutions are 
they're not funded by the state, they're privately funded. And mm. so because some institutions could be privately funded, sometimes things could kind of be short and you kind of just have to work with what you have. Um, so that for me, my first year was the, I think the biggest struggle. Like I wanted to have more resources to teach my kids or I wanted to do more things with them or um, just try and communicate with the parents. It, it, it was it was difficult at first. And, and for clarity, it, it's really interesting because a lot of people that do take their kids to public schools, often they don't have to pay because ta the, our taxes are paying for that, right? That's true. But when they do go to a faith-based school, often the parents have to pay out of pocket. Yes. yes, they are paying for a higher quality uh, education for their children mm -hmm. at times, um, but they're also concerned about curriculum. They're also concerned about yeah. the quality. And as you know, there's that common speculation of like, well, technically they're not even licensed. How right. are they going to even be able to manage a curriculum? Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts about that? So there are a lot of misconceptions like that when it because private school institutions can hire who they see fit as that um, for that position, whether that person does have a license or not. And a lot of people will try to disqualify teachers just because they don't have a license. Um, but I, what I would say to that is if someone is really passionate about being a teacher and helping those students with their curriculum and working with the parents, that they're going to work as hard as they can. They're going to be going to seminars. They're going to be taking classes of their own. They're going to work as hard as they can to educate and help the kids that are in their classroom. Um, mm. And I think that is the big difference you know, in public school, yes, do they have a license? Did they go to school to have the requirements to be a teacher? Yes, of course. But I think you don't necessarily find a lot of teachers in public school who truly, truly, genuinely um, care about some of the students. And some of them that do, it's really, really hard to because they're not backed up by administration or they themselves don't have the resources. You know, it's being in private school, um, you know, Yes, we have limited resources as well, but just just to say, well, you're not licensed, you're not qualified, I think is a really, I think that robs people the privilege of being able to be taught by somebody who is self-taught, somebody who is really, really trying at their job and will try to get better as time goes on. Because a lot of people, when they become public school teachers, um, they get their degree, they get their license, they sit in that position for 15, 20 years, and they don't really move forward. Hmm. versus, you know, going to seminars, going to classes. I have a lot of colleagues who they're in the middle of getting their master's degree or they, you know, my principal, God bless her, she offers seminars for us to go to during the year to help kids who have disabilities, to help kids who are dyslexic, to further our education as teachers. Because if we're educating students all the time, we ourselves have to be learning at the same time as well. Well, there's that common um, quote, right? Remain teachable. Yes. And how can you teach when you're not teachable? How can you be able to show and raise up uh, youth in, right. a, in a particular kind of setting when you're not willing to be set up for success? How can you set mm -hmm. up others for success? Right. And I think like um, even to the point of having low funds, right? Yeah. Even in public schools, often teachers have to set up like their own Amazon wish list per se mm -hmm. because um, they often have to put in their own money to be able to raise up funds or whatever it might be to have uh, utensils for their own kids. Yeah. Yeah. Schools do provide an amount, but they don't provide the whole amount. So, um, and even when you do taxes in your tax deductions, there's not a lot of money breaks that occur when a public school teacher is able to invest for their own kids. Do you mm -hmm. often find yourself investing in your youth out of your own pocket? I do, especially for my classroom in uh, multiple ways. We ourselves have an Amazon wish list as well, but at the same time, it's a wish list. You could only get so much and you can only work with what you have and make the best of what you have. Mm -hmm. I have a wish list too, Pastor Anna. <laughs> What's on your wish list, Danny? My future wife. Oh my God. You know? <laughs> oh my gosh. That's oh. at the top of the list. Oh my goodness. It's number one right now. <laughs> uh, well, maybe number two. Number one right now is a house. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, there's a saying in Spanish, el que se casa, casa quiere. Mm. He wants to get married, wants a house, right? Interesting. And so why yeah. would I get married if I don't have somewhere to take her? That's a really good point. You know? That's a really, really good I will say, though, if she really, really loves you, she will love you for who you are, not what you have. And she'll buy the house. <laughs> <laughs> and she really loves me. <laughs> <laughs> no, but... Uh, <laughs> well, like, what are some things that parents can do or buy for the youth? Or how can parents contribute? Because I think a lot of times they're like, oh, well, I got my kids, like, a notebook, maybe some crayons, stuff like that. But what are some things that they may not have thought about that could actually contribute a lot to their child's education when they are in a private school? Mm. Um, hmm. So 
A lot of the parents, especially where I work, there is a, a list that the students are required to bring. And when I first saw it, I was like, oh my goodness, this is a really, really big list. Mm. But the um, I realized that that list was so big because it wasn't just for the students. It was also for the supplies for the teachers to have as well. Mm. On the, the supply list is paper towels, a dry erase markers, tissues, like just your, your basic, basic stuff, because sometimes the school is not able to provide that. Um, and I think one of the <laughs> One of the biggest things that would help a kid in their education is hand sanitizer, tissues, and face masks. Because how many kids are out during the year because of sickness and how much work they miss is so mm. detrimental to their learning. Especially when it's like test taking time or, you know, if there's a break or if it's, um, you know, we have a, a, a steam fair that is going on at our school. We do it every year where it focuses on like the sciences and the arts and, you know, when kids get out sick or they're not able to keep up with their work so can, my can you personal, tell us what is steam steam it's um it stands for oh my gosh i'm gonna butcher this is please it forgive STEM me or steam steam it's s-t-e-a-m it comes from stem but the a stands for arts okay so it adds everything that stem is there for but then it adds arts into it because i know that there's a non-profit here in lynn it's called um building bridges through music and they have mm. stream which is the r is for reading yeah so I think that's really interesting. And um, well, to the point of people getting sick, do you feel and how do you feel that the pandemic affected the youth having been out of school or even remote for the last two years? Oh my gosh. It, it, oh, wow. That's a really, really big question because it the pandemic really, really affected our kids in the school um, just by seeing how they their attention span even their motivation to work their mm -hmm. you know interactions in class everything is just because we live in a digitalized world it's really really sad to say but sometimes kids don't know how to be kids anymore because you know wow. even a delayed um gratification I'm teaching kids what delayed gratification is because they're so used to having a computer in front of them or not be, having to complete the work or, you know, having games to, um, you know, play at home versus using their imagination to play with dolls or Hot Wheels or something that requires more, um, more intellectual connection. I, I hate to say it like that, but mm -hmm. I think the pandemic has really... It, I feel like the pandemic, as it put a pause in our society and how we function, it did that for some of our kids as well. It put a pause in how they're able to function socially, um, mentally, even physically sometimes. It put a pause on their educational um, and mental growth. And it's it, we're seeing the effects of that when it comes to taking tests and doing homework and really just being able to have creative thinking. Um, and trying to build on those skills, even when there's a gap, especially during their age. Like, let's say um, the pandemic happened when a kid was five years old. Yeah. Well, now two, three years later, they have to go into second grade or third grade and now do times tables and have all these skills when that time where they were supposed to be building in their emotional and mental intelligence and creative thinking, that's all missing because they were at home. That's mm. all missing because it was in front of a screen. That you know, interaction that you're able to have and the things that you learn only through being in person, they missed out on. And those years of their lives are so, so important because their development is crucial at that age. And so it's, it's kind of like teachers, I, I, I think are trying to play catch up. And, you know, I feel like even in my classroom personally, most of the time during the year, yes, I teach curriculum, but that's the easy part. The hard part oh. is teaching these kids how to interact with each other. The hard part is teaching them manners. The hard <laughs> part is teaching them how to be nice and how to turn in their homework and the basic life skills. That's what it, uh, I'm teaching and, most and, of the year. You know what? I think that's a perfect transition to the, my next question for you because a lot of parents think that the job of the teacher is to be a parent also. Mm -hmm. And it's like my job as a teacher is not to discipline your kids. Yeah. My job as a teacher is not to raise your kids. Right. And often, even me as a mentor, often I get the phone call, hey, Danny, my child's acting up, fix it. Mm. It's like, dude, I'm not the parent. Yeah. I'm not the father. I don't go home with these kids. By the way, they're not really acting up all that crazy in my, in my setting. Mm -hmm. But when they get home, even if I give them the tools and they're not using them or being reinforced yeah. at school or sorry, at home, mm -hmm. it doesn't really work. So other than a cat of nine tails, what does <laughs> discipline look like at a private school? Oh boy. Um, so I will say that my school is great when it comes to discipline. I have an administration that backs me up if I send someone to the principal's office, if I write someone up, if I give someone detention, which I don't like to do. I don't, I don't like to, you know, have to discipline a kid, but I will do what's necessary to keep my classroom in order. So 
what discipline looks like, um, I was actually kind of surprised when I first started teaching because they were really, really strict when it came to, you know, swearing or um, missing your homework or things like that. Um, mm. But I understood over time why they were so strict about it. Because believe it or not, if you give kids an inch, they will take a mile and they will walk all over you. Mm. Right. <laughs> so, but I think when it comes to disciplining kids, if you don't have that administration backing you, you can't have your classroom in order. So it's a it's a team effort when it comes to discipline. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. So if you give me an example, so for example, say maybe there's a child in your class, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe they're raising their voice, they're being disrespectful, maybe they're throwing things around, probably having a tantrum at a, in a fourth grade class, right? <laughs> yes. What is your first instinct? Like, what do you do? So my rule in my classroom is you get a warning, right? Mm -hmm. That's I, I speak to you and say, hey, that behavior is not acceptable. If you do it again, you're going to receive this consequence, right? And if they do it again, how I, how I structure it is I will take a point off of their recess. Um, and I'll keep doing that the more the more times I've talked to them, the more minutes they have taken off the recess. Now, say that a, a kid does something outlandish, like you were saying, how they are starting to throw stuff, or if they are screaming, or if they get in a fight with somebody, um, I will tell them to physically leave the classroom and go outside, and I'll have a conversation with them and say, okay, you have two choices here. You have the choice of you can calm down out here, leave your attitude outside, and then come back in, and we can finish what we were doing. Or you can go to the principal's office and talk to them and tell them what happened. See, that's probably why I'm not a teacher, because I would take the, <laughs> the good old taser out, you know, put them yeah, in their place. Right. Uh, it'll be shocking, but it'll work. Um, they'll nice never do it again. Fun. I guarantee you that. <laughs> um, well, I know that uh, when I was growing up, I was in a school where youth that were either had special education, had mm -hmm. some form of... Uh, Oh gosh, IEP. Yes. Or unfortunately, I grew up in an era which, because I'm like significantly younger than you, um, <laughs> I grew up in an era where a lot of the kids ha actually had to wear yellow shirts. So we really? had uniforms. It was white and green, but youth that had IEPs, they had to wear yellow and green. They were the oh, inner quote goodness. special kids, right? Wow. And they were in specific classrooms. Not all of them had the same disability, right. but they shoved them all into the same classroom. Yeah. But it sounds like nowadays everybody's mixed up, right? In different mm -hmm. classes, you get to be with like, regular, not regular peers, but non-IEP, I would say, peers, yes. but then you also get to be with other peers that might have IEPs. Yes. So what is um what is the most common IEP you see being implemented in your setting, particularly in your classroom? And what are things that you're doing to make your class more accessible? Um, in my class, the most common thing that you would see in IEP is dyslexia. Hmm. Um, and, you know, these kids that have dyslexia, they're super, super smart. They study really, really hard, and they really try to do well in school, but their disability sometimes keeps them from getting that grade that they want. Now, how I work with them and how I, tell, how I, I set the goal for them, I say, I want to see progress. I don't mm. care if you get an A. I don't care if you get a B. If you come into my classroom the first quarter and you have a D in spelling, but by the third quarter you have a B, that's you we've accomplished our goal i want to see progress i want to see that you're trying and on my end i'm trying to do research on how to help them um get better in the area that they struggle whether that's decoding words whether that's um using visual aids whether it's you know i will do what i can to help them achieve that goal of progress and getting better um mm. because i don't believe that somebody's disability can disable them I don't think that that could, you know, I think it can happen if you let it. I, I truly think that, it, you know, people obviously, they have struggles, they have these disabilities, but there are ways to work around it. There are ways to maneuver around it. Um, and, you know, it, that doesn't just apply for someone who's dyslexic. That applies to someone who's blind or someone who has autism. Um, oh, know. my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> my heart. Uh, well, you know, I often, and, and to your point, I often tell people, like, it's not my disability that disables me. Yes. It's the things that are not made accessible to me that right. are disabling. Mm -hmm. Yesterday, I was at a city meeting, and we were talking about uh, some of our recreational areas here in Lynn. And one of the things that I was telling them is it's very unfortunate that for me as a blind person, I can't go to a local park or a local recreational area because it's not accessible to me. Right. And so it's not my blindness that disables me from going. It's the park that's not made accessible that disables me from entering that place, right? And it doesn't just stand true for a park. It stands true for my job. It stands true for a school. It stands true when I was going to Salem State University and so forth. Yeah. And even as you guys can see, I'm using a laptop here on the camera and I'm using a screen reader. So as we're having a conversation, I'm listening to my notes and I'm trying to manage all of these things. But if I didn't have my notes, if I didn't have these things made accessible to me, I would be a lot more limited 
limited. So it yeah. is very challenging, I think, as a teacher, especially when parents think that you have all the answers, right? And when yeah. we open up that box of uh, that Pandora's box, um, for powers. lack of a better word, <laughs> yeah, they think we have like this magic wand where we strike their kids and it's a done deal. But right. that's not how it works. And a lot of it, like I said earlier, it's not just us re uh, reinforcing what we believe in class. Yeah. It's also them taking it home and reinforcing it at home. Yes. Yeah. And yeah. so I also seen a lot of youth fall behind in reading. Yeah. Um, what are mm -hmm. some of the, the strategies that you recommend parents when their kids are falling behind in certain areas? So whenever a child is falling behind in any area, whether that be math or reading or science, um, I will always reach out to the parent and say, listen, this has to be a, a team effort. Because I could give your kid every single thing that they need in the classroom, but if you're not helping them at home, you're missing half the pie. You're missing half of the workload. So how do you expect them to complete this entire task when they're only getting half of what they need? Mm. Um, and uh, to answer your question when it comes to, comes to reading, um, I tell the kids, if you're having trouble in reading, you need to practice. You need to read at home. You need to be reading at least 20 minutes a day. And that is the thing that I struggle with my students a lot is because they hate reading. A right. lot of kids... I mean, even when I was growing up too, but I think also because our age has been so digitalized, they could just listen to a book. And mm -hmm. that unfortunately, even our kids with dyslexia, they need to practice reading more. But unfortunately, some of them are, they like to listen to books better because then they don't have to do that work right. of decoding and actually looking at the page. But they'll say, oh, well, I'm still reading. Well, no, you're not. You're listening and mm -hmm. you're comprehending what you're hearing. That's totally different from looking at a page and following along on the lines and comprehending what the words are and sounding it out in front of you. Yeah. And so what I tell parents and what I do in my classroom, um, because I noticed this really, really early on that my kids had a lot of trouble reading, reading out loud, um, sounding out words, even, you know, the basic reading comprehension skills. And the system that I set up in my classroom was, um, I don't know if you had this when you were little, but when I was in third grade, they had an AR system where if you read a book, they had this system where you could go take a quiz on it. And if you got, um, if you passed the quiz and you got a certain amount of points and then you got a prize. When I was little, we didn't even have quizzes. Oh my I don't gosh. even think we had books. What? Oh my goodness. <laughs> no, I'm where did you go to school? No, I'm uh, in Flintstones times, you know? Yeah. Uh, no, but yeah, that's really interesting. And I think it's a collaborative approach, right? I think it has to be not just the teachers yes. reinforcing. I think it's not just trying to spark up the interest in youth, but mm -hmm. also the parents being more involved, more present, right? Yes. And being more aware of what their kids' needs are, but also being aware of how they can motivate their children. Mm -hmm. I know for some people that I work with in the field, um, having a reward system works. Okay, yes. you read this book and you tell me what it's about, I'll get you this, right? Yeah. Or mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. you finish these three books and you write a report for me on it. Um, I'm, th I'm thinking of this movie, I don't know if you ever watched it, it's called Gifted Hands. It's mm -hmm. about Dr. Carter. It was an African-American who, uh, be I believe he did the first uh, brain... Um, uh, it was like a parting, basically two brains that were attached. Oh, it wow. was the first surgery that was successful. And so one of the things that he was talking about was when he was young, the mom would always come in. They, him and his brother would always be on the TV. The mom used to be a housekeeper. So she would go out and, and about and would clean all these houses. Mm -hmm. Well, one day she was like, what is it about this man that I work for that he's so rich? Mm -hmm. And she's walking around in the home and she notices something. These big bookshelves filled with books and books <laughs> and books and books. Yeah. So one day she gets home and she's like, Carter, all of you, get off the TV. Turns out, and the kids are like, hey, what, what are you doing? <laughs> Turns out off the TV. And you're going to read and you're going to write me a book report every single week about every book that you, that you read. Ooh. And the kids are like freaking out. Like, what's, what's wrong with you, woman? Oh, you yeah. Know? But that, that was the seed that was planted in order for Dr. Carter to be able to be the successful brain surgeon. Yeah. But it took discipline. It mm -hmm. took sacrifice. It took a mother to say, no more. I'm breaking this generational bondage of my children not being able to be academically where they can be because nothing's holding them back.